Hello and welcome to the business of story. I'm Park Howell, who some call the world's most industrious storyteller. Why? Because, well, I help business leaders, sales professionals, and HR directors excel through the stories they and their people tell. And I'm so glad you're here. Today, we have one of my all-time favorite authors on storytelling, Lisa Cron. She's here to review her new and amazing book, Story or Die, How to Use Brain Science to Engage, Persuade, and Change Minds in Business and in Life. But first, our story marketing moment for you. Let me set the stage with acclaimed author and satirist Kurt Vonnegut, who expertly defines the shape of every story ever told. (laughs) The whole thing, we call this story man in hole, but it needn't be about a man, and it needn't be about somebody getting into a hole. But it's just a good way to remember it. Somebody gets into trouble, gets out of it again. People love that story. (laughs) They never get sick of it. That's it. If you want to win over an audience with a thought-provoking, action-inducing, edge-of-your-seat-sitting story... Don't tell them how wonderful you are and all the great things you've accomplished in your career with your product or service. Instead, tell them where you blew it. You hear it all the time. Be vulnerable and authentic. But what that really means is tell people how you fell in a hole and got out of it. That's the story they want to hear because they get to try on your trouble and learn what they do if it ever happens to them. We're going to explore that whole concept today with Lisa. I once had a venture capitalist on my show, and all he talked about in the first 10 minutes was all of his major successes. I told him that was all well and good, but what our listeners really wanted to hear were about his missteps, when he made a bad call, what it cost him, and how he recovered. The man or woman falls in a hole and gets out is what our survival brain wants to hear. And those are the stories you need to tell. Trust me, you build understanding and empathy in the process. The two essential sticky ingredients in every story that binds your world to their world. You can learn exactly how to tell this story in my new book, Brand Bewitchery which will show you how to wield the story cycle system to craft spellbinding stories for your brand. Or don't, and see what kind of hole you find yourself in with your business storytelling. Now on to the show. You will learn today from a story crafting master about how stories shape everything you, your people, and your customers do. We misunderstand what emotion is. We misunderstand what it does. And we misunderstand the power of story. And we think of story as soft science. And it is not. (laughs) Story is hard science. Lisa Cron is a story coach, speaker, and the author of Story or Die. Wired for Story, one of my personal favorite storytelling books, and Story Genius. She has been a literary agent, a television producer, and a story consultant for Warner Brothers and the William Morris Agency, among others. She served on the faculty of the School of Visual Arts MFA program in visual narrative and, since 2006, taught in the UCLA Extension Writers Program. She currently advises writers, nonprofits, educators, and journalists on the art and craft of story. Lisa was here on The Business of Story about four years ago, and I am so delighted to have her with us again today. Lisa, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. (laughs) Well, you know I am a huge fan, and in fact, in my book, Brand Bewitchery, I call you out because of the impact your book, Wired for Story, had on me. And one of my favorite all-time sentiments or quotes from that, and I'm going to totally paraphrase, but you said it so beautifully when you said, we live vicariously through the protagonists in a story so that we can try on their trouble to learn what we would do in case it ever happens to us. And we get to do it from the safety of our easy chair. And to me, that was one of the most 
exceptional descriptions of story and why it works that I've used it ever since. Yay. Well, thank you. It's true. Story is literally our first virtual reality, you know, minus that really geeky visor. <laughs> so you started, and correct me if I'm wrong here, as a, a story fiction writer. Is that right? I mean, you, well, well let me just ask you to share your background <laughs> with our audience. Sure. Um, yeah, I wasn't so much a writer, an aspiring writer, perhaps. I worked in publishing and I worked with writers, um, you know, first in publishing as a publicist and then as an editor. And uh, and then I read uh, as a story analyst uh, for for books to film for Warner Brothers and, and as you were saying, the William Morris Agency and, and several other places, um, really diving in to analyzing what made a story. I read thousands of manuscripts, thousands. Um, and what I discovered was that what people thought a story was and what people thought pulled you into a story turned out to be a hundred percent wrong <laughs> that what really was pulling us in was something very 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 different and when I say pulling us into a story I don't just mean a novel or or screenplay or a uh, you know or a memoir I mean you know a, a, a tweet you know something set around the water cooler an ad um, you know a, a, a pitch letter anything we are looking for something very different than what we've been taught and that is what I then wanted to take out into the world. And that's what made me write Wired for Story because it, it, it broke my heart that, as I'm very fond of saying in the writing world, um, everything you've been taught about writing and story is wrong. And I have a big mouth. <laughs> so I wanted to go out there and say, and here's what it really is. And here's what is really pulling us in as opposed to what we've been taught is pulling us in. And for me, very luckily at that time, neuroscience was really, you know, um, I'm going to say coming online. I mean, the discoveries were coming really fast and furious. And it went from thinking, okay, this is like, this is kind of what I, my theory, this is what I think to, wait, this is how we're literally wired. This is how we make sense of everything. Story is actually built into the architecture of our brain and and so that's what brought me to where I am to where I am now. And with this with this latest book, my goal was to take it beyond the writing world, which is the world that I have sort of lived and breathed in for <laughs> more decades than I want to admit to being alive, frankly. Um, because it really is how we make sense of everything, and it really does. At a time now, I feel like the new book is way more timely than it was when I decided to write it because, I mean, the one thing the one thing that I think regardless, you know, what side of the divide you're on, the one thing that we can all agree on is that we've never lived in more polarized times and really understanding how people make sense of things and why, something that I think we all are, are, are facing, you know, every day, why it is that when you want to, you know, engage someone or persuade them of something or, or change their minds about anything, facts just don't work. In fact, I think, I think most of us have noticed that when you try to give someone the facts to change their mind about something, not only doesn't it inform them in the way that we were hoping, but these days it tends to enrage them. Exactly. Let's go back for just a second. I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued by <clears throat> your story work when you were reading these thousands upon thousands of screenplays. Mm -hmm. And was it just this repetition of seeing this content and stories told from you know many different people, many different angles that you had this realization or were you actually taught somewhere along the line of, you know, they're getting it wrong, Lisa, and here's really what it should be? No, it was, <laughs> I hate to think of them. it was me. No one, no one teaches this still. Totally intuitive. A hundred, because, because the question was, I mean, here's the thing. It's one thing to read a book or watch a movie and think that really didn't get me. And, you know, with, with most of us, hopefully if you're reading a book and you don't like it, you just stop. Cause why would you keep reading it? It's, it's not like you're getting paid to read it, but I was getting paid and it wasn't just enough to go, okay, yeah, this sucks. <laughs> so nobody would ever read this. I had to say why. And what I noticed was that what was pulling me in, like I said, was the opposite of what we've been taught. I mean, the things that that 
the people are taught is that what pulls you into any story is either, you know, beautiful writing, which has literally nothing to do with what's pulling us in, or the plot. And that if you, you know, can figure out a plot and then you write it really beautifully, you'll have a story. And that just absolutely couldn't be true. The plot, because the plots tended to be, you know, anything that is quote unquote objectively dramatic is subjectively boring because that's not what we come for. We don't come for what's happening on the outside. We come for how what's happening is affecting somebody internally because we we come literally, we become, it's that, I love to call it like a Vulcan mind meld between, you know, us and whoever the story's about, the protagonist. It, it really is. We are on that wavelength and we are, again, it's it's biology. It is biology. That is that is the thing I'm I'm trying to get out there more than anything else because it isn't theory. It isn't soft science. It's literally biology and how we make sense of things. And when you're lost in a story, the same areas of your brain are lighting up that would light up if you were doing what that you know main character is doing, even if it's the main character in a in a two line tweet. That so to be clear on that, to be clear about that is. You put in a story your protagonist on a journey, on a mission. There is a plot to it, and that plot is important. But what is more important is what's going on between their ears, what's <laughs> happening inside, the transformation that is taking place. So that plot is just the vehicle for something yeah. bigger. And that's what you're you're saying that audiences want. A hundred percent. The plot only has meaning based on how it's affecting the protagonist. I think the big, to, to me, the biggest thing and the thing that I think that that most people who teach story like in the writing world get wrong is that story is not about an external change story is about an internal change and that is a especially true when you're using a story to change someone's mind about something. It's not about teaching them about something external. It's about changing how they see something internally so that then they go out and, and hopefully hear your call to action. I mean, in other words, a story is about how, you know, an unavoidable external problem forces somebody to change internally in order to solve that problem. That's what a story is actually about. And I'll tell you if you have time for one sec, a really interesting um, study that I read recently by uh, a guy named Stephen Brown out of McMaster University in Toronto, right outside of Toronto in Hamilton in, in Canada. And he wanted to see what it was, you know, when we're pulled into a story, what first comes online? What are we looking for? What is the brain hungry for? So he did, right? I mean, they Experiments are always on college students, so they were all wired up in whatever way you get wired up to do an, an uh, you know fMRI. And when I say you know what people get lost in, you know when they when they get pulled into a story, he wasn't like wiring them up and then you know reading them War and Peace or Lolita. He was reading them very simple headline sentences, things like um, <laughs> literally, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, like. Uh, surgeon finds scissors in patient or fisherman saves boy from freezing lake. And what he thought, and he literally said this in the interview, he said what he thought he was going to find is what Aristotle said, because, you know, Aristotle was a smart guy and Aristotle said plot first, character second. So some externally dramatic thing was going to happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hold on one second. <clears throat> something external would happen, we'd be pulled into that, and then we'd look for the person. And the exact opposite happened. In other words, Aristotle was, you know, wrong. What happened was the first part of the brain that came online was the part that mentalizes, meaning the part that immediately came up and said, whose story is this? What do they want? What is their intention? <clears throat> what is their desire? What are they afraid of? What's their motivation? That is the first thing that we look for in a story. When people talk about story logic, they don't mean the external logic of the plot. They mean the internal subjective logic that the main character, the protagonist is using to make sense of what's happening out there in the world. That yeah, and it's, it, for. It, it's implications in business is when you are creating an audience persona is to ask yourself, what do they desire? What do they fear? Why do they not have something? How, what, how does that impact them psychologically? And then how can you be there to help them get what they want on their journey, in their plot? But you have to first really understand what's going on between their ears. 
Exactly. You have to understand not just that they're not doing what you want them to do, but you have to understand why they're not doing it. And this is the really hard part. You have to understand why they're not doing it in their opinion, as opposed to in your opinion. And that is the hardest thing when you're trying to convince anyone of anything, because the truth is it's very easy to look at it and read your own meaning into why what you think they should be doing would be important to them. Mm -hmm. And really often they have their own why they're not doing it. And it's almost always not what it appears to be on the surface. You have to really dig for it. And you have to really understand that when you're asking anybody to change anything, you're asking them to do something hard because change is hard. You're asking them to give up something that matters to them. So if you are doing that, you have to understand it's not just a an even swap. What is that thing that they're going to have to give up in order to hear what you need them to hear? And I think that really comes down to asking yourself, okay, what is their misbelief? What is that thing that they believe that is keeping them from hearing your call to action? What is that? And then the goal is to create a story that doesn't tell them why it's wrong, because we all know what happens when you try to tell someone why they're wrong about something. You know, it's sort of like oh, yeah. you go to your significant other and you go, we've got to talk. You know, they, they should say, okay, yeah, but not now, because the minute you said we have to talk, it's going to be something, you're going to tell me something's wrong with me. So I'm sitting here thinking of all the things that are wrong with you <laughs> so that we can just, you know, throw rocks at each other. I mean, they need to find it out on their own through the story. And it's the external thing that happens that forces them to question that misbelief in order to solve the problem that they are, that they're faced with, a, you know, a, a problem yeah. they can't avoid. You know, I think about Aristotle and you're talking about, he said, plot before character and you feel like, no, that is completely wrong. It's, it's really the character first. And I wrote that down thinking, you know, the old way of thinking about this is theatrics versus thinking. And you want to flip that. You want to first understand what is your audience thinking, you know, what motivates them. Now, can you give us an example of a brand with this idea of misbelief, a, a case study out there? Your book is filled with them, and I love them. Could you share one of those with our listeners about how a brand can use this idea around misbelief and then correct that into their favor? Sure. I mean, let me give you the simplest um, the simplest example from the book. And it's, it's an example that literally really has just two words in it. And it is a, uh, I think it was from, from 2015, it was a, uh, a Subaru commercial. And Subaru, as we, <laughs> at least back then, I happened to, full disclosure, and this has nothing to do with why I picked it, but I happen to drive a Subaru and I love my car and I think it's beautiful. But for a long time, Subarus were known as, you know, not really very good looking cars, but they were really safe cars. And All right, real quick, Lisa, full yeah. disclosure here. I just traded in my Toyota Tacoma truck, a beautiful red 2017 that I used in our move over the course <laughs> of the last two years up to our new home up here. And my wife and I bought a Subaru Ascent and we uh, absolutely love it. It is just, it is so great. One. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they're, they're fabulous. They are anyway, best car I ever drove, but yep. <laughs> this was long before that. And, and they wanted to get across then they wanted to, they knew that they were safe and they had all sorts of people, you know, writing into them going, Oh my gosh, I got in this awful accident and your car saved me. And they wanted to get that message out into the world. And so, the misbelief that they really wanted to counter when they were looking for it was, okay, what do most people think happens when you get into one of those really awful car crashes? And that is, and I'm sure we've all had that experience. You know, you're driving on the freeway or you're driving down the street and you see a car that is like utterly mangled and like your heart just you feel like, oh my, those poor people, like nobody could have survived that. And that was the misbelief. If you get into a really awful crash, you're basically going to be a goner. So that was what they wanted to counter. And to do that, it was really interesting. They did something that <laughs> in car commercials, it's something that's like, okay, first rule of a car commercial. If you're going to show a car commercial, do not show a car that has been in a really horrible accident, right? Because that's the last thing you want people thinking about if you want them to actually go out and buy your car. 
but this ad opened and it's like, it's an early morning and the camera's moving in and there's this car that is really mangled. And there's, you know, a, I think it's a cop who's standing looking at it and another I think it was a cop, I can't remember who it was, comes up and looks at the first cop and he's got this look on his face like, oh, that, those poor people. And the cop just looks at him and he just says, they lived. And it's like, it's like I can feel, even as I say it, like the hair on the back of my neck is standing up because it's so meaningful. And then that's repeated three times as then the tow truck driver, you know, pulls into the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the junkyard with a car and the junkyard, you know, guy's got this look on his face, like, Oh God, those poor people. And he just says they lived. And then it's repeated a third time. And then finally the commercial ends with a, a family coming out of, uh, you know, of the house. It was a, a woman, a man and two kids. And the guy just says, you know, we lived thanks to our Subaru. And then they get into a brand new unmangled Subaru and drive off. And so that was a perfect, I thought, example of misbelief. If you get into a, an awful crash, you're inherently going to die. Truth, maybe not with a Subaru, realization, wait a minute, I'm going to get a new car. Maybe that's the car I should get. And then transformation, you know, where's my, 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 uh, where's the nearest Subaru dealer? So that would be a really simple example. And because they knew what the misbelief was, they had the courage to give us a commercial that, I mean, <laughs> because you're, I mean, I can't think of any other commercial that starts with a mangled, you know, car commercial mm -hmm. that starts with a mangled car, that is going to grab your attention because it's surprising. And that is, you know, one of the first rules of any kind of a story. A story is about what happens when our expectations are not met. That is for that external part, the, the unavoidable problem. And that certainly would grab someone's attention because, you know, I mean, like I said, we don't usually see car commercials that start with the car yeah. that they're trying to sell us squished. So Lisa, you talk about these four steps of misbelief, then deliver a truth, then a realization coming from that truth, and ultimately the transportation, which leads to the call to action and people move. It seems yeah. to me in this that really you are working around contradiction, that there has to be a problem to be solved to make it really work. So the misbelief is you get in a bad car wreck, you're a goner. All yeah. right. So the contradiction is actually that's not true. Let us show you what the truth is. The realization is, aha, oh, yeah, good point. You've, you've sold me on that transformation as you step into a Subaru dealership. Is it is that pretty much a structure for all stories as basic as that can be? I think so. I mean, the key thing, I mean, yes, at the end of the day, there's a lot more to it, but absolutely positively, the key thing though, is that the character, meaning the person going through the story has to be the one who comes to the realization at the end. Nobody can shame them. They, you don't want to tell them what the truth is. You want them to see it and realize it on their own, as opposed to somebody stepping up and going, let me explain to you why this misbelief isn't true. The minute you or even someone in the story is going to explain why something isn't true, now you've completely alienated the person who's, whose mind you're trying to change. Now, immediately, up's going to come all the reasons why they think you're wrong, because when you tell anybody they're wrong about anything, it, and again, this is biology. You know, we, we often go, well, you know, when I try to tell anybody anything, you know, crazy uncle, uncle Wally, who's going to come and tell you whatever you believe that the opposite is true. And you think when I try to give him the facts, he gets so angry. What's wrong with him? The truth is we all do that because we are wired to take in anything that contradicts what we already believe. Because once we believe something, it becomes part of our self-identity, which also helps us identify with our tribe. It comes across as a personal insult. And that's biology. It's not because we decided it would. It's not because we're weak or, or self-centered or just you know not smart enough. It literally lands like like somebody said, put up your dukes. And in fact, when that happens, not only do we start to argue back, but but blood rushes to our thighs just in case we got to, you know, run out of there. It's again, it's biology. We're, we're sort of wired to live in a world we don't live in anymore. And I think one of the biggest just problems that we have in life is that we've been taught that we can think our ways out of out of things sort of in a rational way 
being rational is something we sort of invented. And it just literally doesn't work that way. We don't ever make decisions based on our rational analysis of anything. We make decisions based on how our rational analysis makes us feel. And that's because of how we're wired, not because we're just not smart enough or, you know, or we just, you know, don't have the the grit in us to do it the right way. Yeah. So what you're saying is then as a business leader or a brand manager, you don't want to be out there telling your audiences what to do, telling your colleagues that now we're doing it the wrong way. You got to do it my way or it's the highway. Um, you don't want to come across as the braggadocious chest pounding brand out there. You want to involve your audiences in your story by allowing them to come to the aha moment or the realization that, oh, I do need to do something different here. And exactly. instead of telling them, you are just beckoning them into your way of thinking, into your world. Exactly. I mean, I think that that's exactly, but the key thing in order to do that, you have to really understand why aren't they doing it already? I mean, first, before that, even you have to figure out what it is you want them to do specifically. What's what's your specific call to action? And then who is your audience? Who, who are the people that are going to be able to, to hear that, that will be able to benefit it? Who are you talking to? Because it's very easy to make the mistake of either thinking that your audience is you. And by that, I mean, they're going to like it for the same reasons you do. They're going to need it for the same reasons you do. It's going to be important to them for the same reason it's important to you. And that is never going to be mm -hmm. true. Or you're going to think your audience is absolutely everybody. And the one thing your audience never is, is everybody, because each segment of the audience is going to have their own misbelief. So once you've figured out who that is, then the question is, what specifically do you want them to do? What are they doing now instead? And really importantly, why aren't they doing what you want them to do? And the answer can't be because they've never heard of it. <laughs> Because they will have reasons why they won't do it, even if they have never heard of it. So what what is that reason to them? Why, why wouldn't they do it as far as they're concerned? What is it about doing it that would fulfill a need that they've got? Something that they might not even realize. They, they might even, not even realize they've got this need now, but you can see it. And then you want to create the story that, external, whatever that's going to be, you know, whatever that trajectory is, will be very specific that will go, that will force them to reevaluate that misbelief mm -hmm. in order to solve the problem that you've set up for them. And it is that reevaluating, reevaluating the misbelief that matters. It is that, that's what we come for. In the writing world, I say, we want to see the penny drop. When they come to that aha moment where they realize that their misbelief has been holding them back as opposed to helping them, the internal logic, the subjective logic is what we come for. That is what we're looking for. That, that aha moment toward the end, it needs to come toward the end because it's what solves the problem. And you want the protagonist to be the one who solves the problem. The, you know, the protagonist being, you know, your reader's avatar within the story or your, you know, your customer, your, 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 uh, your employee, they are the person within the story. You want it to come toward the end. You want it to be transparent so that we can see that internal logic. You want it to come so that once that happens, then they will be able to solve the problem. That is that is what you're looking for at that moment. And then at that at that <laughs> at that moment, now they're seeing the world differently. Yeah. It's like I had mentioned at the top of the show, per your first book, Wired for Story, is you were getting them to connect with and live vicariously through the protagonist in that story, as you said, their avatar, so that they can try on their trouble <laughs> and just to see what yeah. they could do in case it ever happens to them. When I'm coaching on business storytelling for you know, leaders and brand managers, when I'm, they are putting together a long form communication or a presentation or whatever, I ask them to first start with these three questions. It's really one question, three parts. Mm -hmm. What do you want your audience to think, feel, and do when you're all said and done? That's what, what is the end game here? Think, feel, and do. A lot of logic doesn't play into this. It's like, I want them to think, boy, this wasn't a waste of time, or this was really helpful. I want to feel excited optimistic. 
uh, FOMO if I'm not moving? And then specifically, what do you want them to do with that knowledge and that emotion to get them, you know, what is your CTA to get them moving forward? And that seems to have been really easy to boil it down to give, you know, my students and my Mm -hmm. clients that end game. But here's the question for you. Yes. I get so locked up in the theory and the studies. I mean, I'm like you, I've read just tons of books on storytelling and I've got the hero's journey down and why it works and the neurology and da 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 da. But you know what? In business, most people, they don't want that. They just like park, just how do I make it happen? What do I do next? What do I do? Do you have in all of your work and all the screenplays you've written, the books you or read, the books you've written, uh, the neurology studies you've taken that can you simplify it for a harried, distracted business person sitting across from you and saying, Lisa, I don't have time. And actually, I'm not even that interested in all the theory right now. I just need something that I can do right away that's going to be effective. That is a really good question. <laughs> because I don't know. I don't know that it's that it is easy. I mean, the thing that comes to mind the most is and the word that comes to mind the most is vulnerability. Is it's the ability to be vulnerable, the ability to think, okay, if you're going to tell a story that's going to pull someone in, you need to allow yourself to be vulnerable, to make mistakes, to show a time where you thought something was true and the world showed you it wasn't. And then you realized your mistake and going forward because of what you realized, you were able to make a change. I think that is the simplest answer to that because I don't know that it is simple. And I, I, honestly, if I if I could if I could and if, if I could be really honest, I think that's the biggest problem with the world that we've got out there now is that we think everything is going to be fast and we think there's going to be a simple solution to everything. And if we can't do it quickly, it isn't worth doing. And I don't think that that's true. I think sitting with vulnerability and realizing this is going to take some time and I might get it wrong, but this is really important, makes a difference. I think the other thing, if I had to say one thing, thinking about it, because you're making me feel vulnerable right now. <laughs> Just <laughs> letting you know. It's like I, I'm totally on the hot seat. I mean, I would really, really – Think when you are trying to change someone's mind about someone, about something, and that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about somebody's going to go in and they can convince somebody else of something else. I think the key thing, and this does go to vulnerability, is to really look at that person, bringing it down to a person, even if it's your whole audience, you know, that person, someone who personifies that, maybe it is one person, and pull yourself out of your own mindset. And really try to empathize with them and put yourself into their head and why they would benefit from what it is that you want them to do in their own opinion. Not why you think it's good, but why would it matter to them? Even if you're talking about your sales team, right? Even if you're talking about employees where, I mean, they're there at your pleasure. You're paying them to do what you want them to do. But it means stepping out of yourself and going, well, why would this matter to them in their world? I honestly think that's the key. I mean, I have to say um, one of the uh, one of the things I'm sort of most proud of with this with this book going out is is I got um, a blurb from um, Seth Godin and he he called it um, uh, the, the art of practical empathy and. That's what I think matters the most. If you can't empathize with the person whose mind you're trying to change about anything, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. That, to me, is the absolute key part of it. And that steps into the other thing that I think is the most important, not just when it comes to, uh, you know, business or changing someone's mind or, or, you know, or origin stories or branding which is really understanding, and, and I know that this does sort of come back to um, 
theory is the wrong word, but understanding our world, which is understanding the role that emotion plays in everything that we do, because it has been not only misunderstood, but it has been, it has been, you know, villainized to a place where it's looked at as the opposite of what it actually is. And I think that's what stands in our way. Because when you said those three things, it was what was thought, emotion, and action. Were those the yeah. three things? Yeah, basically, think, feel, and do. Right, exactly. And here's the point. What emotion is, is emotion telegraphs meaning. We have emotion to let us know what we believe. We can't sit and figure things out to the nth degree. Emotion is what, I mean, once we believe something, it gets relegated down to what's called our cognitive unconscious. And then when something happens, we feel something that lets us know what that thing, what that, the thing that's happening, what that means to us. Emotion is not separate from meaning. Emotion is what literally lets us know what things mean. And here's a, here's, here's, here's a, an interesting thing. There is never a moment in any of our lives, any of us, when we are not feeling. Nothing happens to us. We don't think anything, read anything, experience anything, when we are not ex- experiencing a chorus of emotion, which is a, a chemical reaction that our brilliant brain and nervous system then immediately translates from feeling into emotion that lets us know what things mean to us. We never make up our minds based on our rational analysis of the situation. We make up our minds based on how that rational analysis makes us feel. That's what it means to be human. So really thought and feeling, and I think that's exactly what you're saying, Park, are the same thing. What you want is you want to tie that feeling. And yes, it should be hopefully something not just optimistic, but something that makes a person feel like they are, and I hate using this phrase because it's so overused these days, but their most authentic self, you know, to take out into the world. But then it's tied to what that call to action is. In other words, the meaning that your call to action has to that person evokes that very specific emotion. You're looking to tie those two things together. And that's exactly what an effective story does. And again, an effective story can be, you know, can be two words, can be they lived. It it does not have to be anything that is in any way, shape or form long. So Lisa, you had two really successful books out with Wired for Story and Story Genius. Why did you write Story or Die? I wrote Story or Die because I, I'll, t- I'll, t- I'll be honest with you. It took me a long time to decide to write it. It took me four years or, uh, well, yeah, it took me four years to really decide, yes, I'm going to do this from when I had the idea and actually, you know, had sort of sold the proposal up until when I decided to actually do it. And the reason that I was hesitant is because story c- can, as I think that, that, that we have seen writ large all over the world recently can be used to take us really far in the wrong direction. Story is the most potent tool out there. Story is, we communicate through story every minute of every day. We are affected by stories every minute of every day, whether we know it or not. And I was sort of afraid of writing a book that would take, that would really emphasize that and really break it down because the book is very prescriptive. I mean, it's different than your, I love your book park, by the way. I have oh, to thank say, you. my book is prescriptive and sort of, a, we're both prescriptive. Mine is different than yours, but, but I think both yeah. really, you know, end up with, uh, I think we both went into writing these books with the same notion of there's a ton of theory out there, but how do you do it? How do you use it? You know, yeah. Lisa, you, you had a profound impact on brand bewitchery in something else I took from Wired for Story, and it is that concept of you have to have a ball in play as yeah. quickly as possible. And when I first wrote Brand Bewitchery, I don't know, eight years ago now, before mm-hmm. I had read your book, I realized that it was kind of boring. And I didn't have balls in play. And so I rewrote the whole Mm -hmm. thing. I guess what it really did is it got my logical side down of how I was going to coach and teach this. And then when I rewrote it, I infused it with stories of of actually, you know, this happening in people's lives, how they use these concepts and whatever. 
but I always thought of you. I th- every time I started a chapter or even a paragraph, if I was going off in another direction, how can I get a ball in play <laughs> yeah. so that I've got I've hooked them from that very first sentence? So thank you for that. Exactly, my my utter pleasure. So with this book, I just realized finally that it really is important to get out there for the world as opposed to to just and I don't mean I don't mean just in the but but just writers um it really I think is important that people understand the power of story because again we're being affected by stories every minute of every day whether we know it or not and mostly we don't and the reason I do think that the theory and the science behind it is important is because we have been sold so much bunk. We have been sold so much bunk that I think so many myths and so many truths out there are so wrong, not just in the writing world, but in the world world, that it really felt important to really, my goal, again, that's why I was so happy to get that, you know, to, to, to hear it was, you know, about the book is about the art of practical empathy, because we misunderstand what emotion is. We misunderstand what it does. And we misunderstand the power of story. And we think of story as soft science. And it is not. <laughs> story is hard science. I think we turn to facts because we have we, because because facts feel so secure. <laughs> facts feel so objective. And if we give someone a bunch of facts, we're not being what we're the most scared of, which is vulnerable. And if we give some of someone a fact and it turns out to be wrong, well, that's not that's not our fault. That's the facts' fault. And it just doesn't work that way because again, when you give people facts, it presupposes that they understand what that fact means, meaning means to you. They understand what you want them to do with it. They understand how that fact is going to affect them in their lives because we come to everything in our lives asking one question. How is that going to affect me in my life? Is it going to help me or is it going to hurt me? Is it going to get me closer to my goal or is it not? We evaluate everything that way. Again, not because we're self-centered or selfish or egomaniacs, but because it's how we're wired. Because if we didn't, we'd you know, cross the street without looking both ways. We we need to ask that question in order to survive. And that's the tacit question we ask of everything and every story. Point being, when you give someone a fact, they're not taking it in and thinking about it objectively. They're thinking, okay, how would that abstract fact personify in my life and affect me? And is that a good thing or a bad thing? And if they can't unpack it that way, and if it doesn't have that effect, They might be looking at you and nodding and smiling. And what they're really thinking is, is that dentist appointment Tuesday or Thursday? (laughs) (laughs) Totally something else. (laughs) Well, Lisa, absolute fantastic book, Story or Die, How to Use Brain Science to Engage, Persuade, and Change Minds in Business and in Life. I'm so happy you came out with this. Where can people find it, learn more about you, and see your great work in action? It comes out and probably this would be after that on March 2nd of this year. So that's like, as, as of this speaking, as of this very moment, that's a week from Tuesday. It's so, pending. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. They can find it, you know, everywhere that books are sold, you know, these days, meaning mostly online, but you yep. know, on Barnes and Noble, you know, every place that way. And I am at my website, which is wiredforstory.com. And yeah, that, and that is, that is where I am. Although, you know, like most of us, I'm I'm in my house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm in my house. But yeah, that is exactly where I am. And I, I'm really looking forward to engaging, you know, now beyond the writing world, because I think that there is just so much good that can be done, both in terms of understanding story, the power of story, how to create a story that that really will resonate with other people. And the other beauty of it, I think, Park, is that when we dive in and we do start to work to empathize with why other people are doing what they're doing, it really helps us understand what we're doing a little bit better. So, I mean, I think it can just make a difference beyond just trying to convince anyone of anything. It really brings us more deeply into, you know, into ourselves. Yeah. You know, I was just looking at my show list. Lisa, you were first here 200 
and 88 shows ago. You were number 10 on my list. You essentially helped me launch Business of Story over five and a half years ago. Thank you for that and for your amazing book, Wired for Story, and for the new book that you're sharing your, your insight. And the other thing I like about your book, it's very witty. You are a fun person to read. So do you think, did you get that naturally or from reading all of those screenplays, did you bring it in by osmosis and found your own voice that way? No, it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> it's because most of those most of those manuscripts and screenplays I read were pretty dreadful. Um, <laughs> no, it's just I have a big mouth. I think I think you know everybody's got their origin story. I think my origin story, you know, forgetting the how I came to believe what I believe, but I think a lot of it was I just have a big mouth and so when I say something, I want to be sure that I can bring it forward and defend it sort of six ways from from Sunday as they say. And um it's just I like to talk I mean, I love to talk. I love people. I love hearing about other people. That's why I love my job so much. I spend, I mean, I am literally talking to people often between six and eight hours a day, which is probably why the pandemic hasn't changed my life that much because I've always consulted by phone or Skype so that I'm still, you know, in a crowd of people always. And it's just, you know, I mean, it's, it's, um, yeah. No, it's, <laughs> it's just, and I also feel that when I'm reading something, I want to feel like somebody's talking right to me. And that's, that's the way that I write. And I also feel like I don't ever, my goal in writing always is to be empathetic and kind and never vilify anybody because I think so much of the stuff that we vilify ourselves for and beat ourselves up for really has to do with just how we're wired and we you know we 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 shame ourselves in in ways that i honestly don't think that we deserve because we tend to be taught that you know every choice everything that we do is a conscious choice that we have made and we've sat there on some sort of surface level and weighed the evidence and it just we couldn't not only couldn't we do that if if we tried it would be a horrible world if we did it just, it just, we are not wired to do that. When people go, oh, well, you know, I mean, we, you know, we didn't make the perfect rational, logical decision because, you know, we're only human. And it's like, no, the only human is the good part. <laughs> that <laughs> is who we are. The way that we have elevated this notion of we make, you know, decisions in this ra- you know, rational, logical way in the cold light of objective reason is something that we made up because it makes us feel safe and secure. It just isn't the way that we process information and that's okay. And so that also is my goal is to be sort of welcoming to everyone on that level, no matter what you believe, because we believe what we believe, because that's what life has taught us. And even when I was talking about misbeliefs, a misbelief is something that every single one of us has probably more than one is something that we learned very early in life and that we firmly believe is true, not because we're dumb or stupid or, you know, or, or, or self-centered, but because our life taught us that it was true. And so it literally becomes part of the lens through which we see everything. And, you know, often we're, we're wrong. And so that's the goal of story is to show us that so we can experience why we're wrong and, and then make that change ourselves rather than, you know, because, someone told you to, because I think one, one thing we can see writ large all over the world right now is that there are a lot of people who, if someone tells them what to do, no matter how important that thing they're being told to do is, they're not going to do it because no one tells me what to do. Isn't that the truth? Well, <laughs> well, Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Fascinating conversation per usual. My utter pleasure. I, I love to talk and I love to talk story. And it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Park. Oh, thanks. And thank you all for listening to this edition. If you like what you heard, by all means, share it out with your friends, family, colleagues. Check out her new book, Story or Die. I just absolutely love it. It's in my library now next to all the other tomes I've read on storytelling. And if you think storytelling is hard, I want you to not think that anymore. I want you to follow her advice. Vulnerability, start there. Tell a story about when 
everything went sideways and what you learned in that process. And you will build such command of your audience because they will appreciate your honesty, your truthfulness about you don't always do everything exactly right. And they will live vicariously through you to get to try on your trouble so that they know what to do if it ever happens to them. And they will be eternally thankful for you as the storyteller sharing that particular story. If I can help you do that very thing, visit me over at businessofstory.com and be back here next Monday when we will have another story artist right here for you like Lisa. Until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks so much for listening.